Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On this week's episode, we have a guest host. So please be the same respectful audience you are for me and enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Heidi. Imagine kicking back while a HIPAA compliant AI scribe writes your soap notes for free. Yes, you heard us right. Heidi is free. I'm Dr. Tom, Heidi's CEO and founder, and we started Heidi to stop clinicians wasting their life on clinical documentation. Heidi transforms your consult babble into crisp, clear soap notes, personalizing itself with every edit. One day, Heidi will be your AI resident, looking through research, explaining plans, and doing anything you don't want to. If you currently pay for an AI scribe in your practice, you should swap to Heidi. We'll even credit you for anything you've already paid. Dive into the description for the link and make your practice the envy of every stethoscope in town. Sign up and watch Heidi work its magic all for free because you've got better things to do. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. John Schneider, and I'm the guest host today on The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. And today we'll be talking with Kevin Wilde, the Executive Leadership Fellow at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. And we'll be talking about his book, Coachability, the Leadership Superpower. Looking forward to it. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Well, Kevin, nice to see you again. Welcome. We'll jump right in. So for the listeners, physician coaching has really taken off in the last few years. I became a physician development coach myself and have coached a number of physicians on on things. But leadership is actually one of the things, one of the skill sets that physicians often find themselves interested in, but also thrust into in many ways with the changes in healthcare systems, practice management, and so on. And so leadership in particular is a skill set that physicians really need. And so in my own readings of this, that's how I came across your book, Coachability, the Leadership Superpower. And in large part, we tend to think of coaching as going out there and getting some coaching around, you know, conflict or whatnot. But if you talk to most leaders in the healthcare industry, and I'm sure in other industries, coaching for leadership is huge. And a huge part of developing your leadership skills and your leadership presence. But your book really struck me. And and it really struck me because it really stood out as one of the most poignant self-assessments that we can do as to whether we're ready for a coach. If you could tell our, our listeners a little bit more about this idea of coachability, how do you define it? So coachability, given, given the research I've done, and, and as well as the teaching and coaching, it breaks into three simple parts. When I started studying highly coachable leaders, what I found is number one, they've got a mindset and they value self-improvement. So that notion, and again, not just not technical knowledge, but you know who I am and how I'm impacting others that I'm curious, I want to get better, I'm not a finished product. So that value and mindset, that growth mindset, that was the, the foundation of a highly coachable leader. And then they did certain things to keep themselves in what I found and I call the learning zone. And we can talk more about that learning zone. And so I've got the value of the mindset. Yep, want to get better. And then they're very self-aware of what their learning zone is when they're in it and they're out of it. And then what I found is they had four very distinctive practices or habits that kept them in the learning zone or sometimes when circumstances would pull them out, when they should be in that learning zone, self-improvement zone, they had little techniques, little habits that helped them get into it. And they use those consistently. So those are the three parts I'd say. Number one, highly coachable leaders value self-improvement, value being coached, getting better. Number two, they know what their learning zone is to be coachable. And number three, they find different habits and techniques in these four dimensions I uncovered that keep them coachable. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about those four dimensions because that's interesting. The journey started, I was a chief learning officer, talent officer at uh, Corporation General Mills. We had a lot of successful leaders, but I started studying failure. How do really good leaders get into trouble? And we had a few of them. And then over time, we had more and we were trying to avoid that. And then later, I did the academic study of what they call derailment, career derailment. And it's really an interesting body of work of high performing, highly skilled, driven leaders that for some reason get over their heads. 
And I started looking, doing a postmortem of the leaders that unfortunately are executives that didn't make it. And one thing I found of interest is their last leadership assessment, their last 360, where others rated their leadership. One item was 30% lower than my average leader. And the one question was, does this leader seek and respond to feedback? 30% lower. And so again, these were people that I believe early in their career were doing it, very open, very interested, a sponge for learning, and then it shut down. And whether it was their own mindset or circumstances that they developed significant blind spots. And while we all have blind spots, I think for these people, it really mattered and got them into trouble. So that led to interviewing 50 executive coaches. What does coachability look like? Doing the deep dive academic study on what's been uh, studied on this topic. Not much, by the way, uh, but a lot of uh, ancillary research. And then from that, put together this model. And so in addition to the mindset, what I found in the literature, as well as my own work, is they systematically sought input. So highly coachable leaders seek you know, I'll call it feedback. I don't like the word feedback. We can talk about that as well. Input, observations, coaching, what I call notes. They found little ways of getting nuggets on how am I doing and what could be better. Then they responded well when it showed up, either because they asked for it or it just showed up. And so they had muscle memory on how to be open, how to be curious and not to be too defensive. But then they would pull back and that would be the third thing is they'd be reflective on what did I hear? How am I reacting? What does it mean? And they would connect the dots more than most of us do on an average day. And then ultimately they decided, yeah, this is valuable. I've got to do something about it. They would take action. So highly coachable leaders, the the four practices, finding ways of seeking input from others on how you're doing, how to get better. Two, responding well openly when it shows up. Three, thinking about it probably more than most of us do. And then finally, okay, I can follow through. I can take action. That's fantastic. And I'll make a plug here. I was going to do it at the end, but I do really want to plug for the listeners. On your website, thecoachableleader.com, there is a self-assessment that you can do that I've done that I learned a lot about myself from your, you know, from your work. I I want to come back to this idea of this 30, you know, folks who really weren't seeking feedback later in their career. Because one of the things that really stuck out to me in reading the book were two aspects that I think are so interesting. So one, you talk about the false finish line, which I think is just a concept that in medicine in particular, I think is much more prevalent than we admit to ourselves. Could you tell us a little bit about that, that false finish line? Sure. Yeah. And what you're referring to is when I started diving into what can go wrong, I found there were both internal assumptions, practices that got in the way, as well as how the environment treats you. And one of the first things that happened is people lose their coachability when they assume I've arrived, right? I got the big job. I've got the responsibility. And to some degree, it's true, right? If you're in a major role of responsibility, you've earned it. You've got a track record of success. You know things, right? But the problem is you start assuming I know it all as opposed to, gee, I could even learn more. And so the false finish line is that notion about, I'm done learning. I'm I'm done taking input, coaching from others. I needed that early in my career. I had the humility to learn. Now my plate is full. I'm good enough. And again, there's some of that's true, right? Some of it's true. You've arrived. But you're never really complete, if you will, in the journey. And well, as the world keeps changing, you got to stay agile, not just, again, your technical skills, but also leadership, your influence, Yeah, in medicine, you know, and I don't think this is different in other professions, but we really value kind of lifelong learning and it's built into the practice of medicine across specialties, but it's leadership is harder in a sense. And I think it's one of the areas where when we're talking about, you know, for example, I'm a a rhinologist, which I'm I'm an ear, nose and throat physician that specializes in sinus surgery and anterior skull base surgery. So Within my specialty and my chosen subspecialty, I'm constantly learning all of the continuing medical education, all of the conferences, all of the lectures. It's a constant feed of new things to learn. The, the, the science changes, as you said, you know, the, the data changes. And so we, we can't learn. But with people, and I think this is where your book really can help physicians, is with people, and we sometimes create a false finish line in the sense that we've decided not just that the subject matter of what we do in our position is, you know, static, but that we know people in a static way. What does that bring up for you? 
Well, that, yeah, that notion about uh, things are in motion. I mean, the, the one thing about, you know, your listeners say, I need to work in my leadership or coachability game. The good news is you're not plowing new territory. You're just doing a transfer. So if you've got the habits in your profession to keep up on the literature, on the studies, on the latest thinking on medicine, like, well, first of all, that, that there's a mindset about you're not done. You just need to apply that to, oh, how am I leading others? How am I influencing? How am I organizing things? How am I, you know, pulling teams together, et cetera? Like, okay, how do I use that same mindset? I can learn more. And that got me into the, the second study that really, you know, unlocked this avoiding things like the false finish line and the notion about the learning zone. So we did a study, 200 leaders. We had 360 surveys. So we had others judging them. Are they coachable or not? high coachable, low coachable, seen by others. And then we had a personality assessment of their confidence level. So we had people, low confidence, medium confidence, high confidence. And then we looked at what's the interaction. And what we found was it's not linear. It's kind of a curve. So think of it, one spot, low confidence, low coachability. And I call that the I, I can't zone. And we're all there. I mean, we have circumstances or challenges like, you know, I'm just not up to this or I'm threatened. I don't have psychological safety. I'm not in that spot. I'm just going to avoid it. Right. So, yeah, I don't want coaching. Then we get the extreme where I spent the last half of my uh, corporate career working with executives that had sometimes too much confidence and, and their coachability was seen as lower by others. And then I call that the I don't care zone. And the sweet spot was in the middle, you know, enough confidence to be open, to learn, to ask and enough humility to know that, yeah, I'm not at the finish line. I need to keep learning. How can I take the situation, the circumstance, this challenge and put myself in learning zone? So I'll often do coaching sessions and training where I'll say, okay, tell me about your own learning zone. What pulls you into it? What pushes you out of it? So again, as you talked about your own you know, practice, like, hey, there's certain things I'm always learning. I'm consuming things. I'm trying new ideas out. Well, you have a mindset and a practice that puts you into that learning zone. How do you then transfer those habits, those skills to keep improving your own leadership. Great. Yeah. It's the, the nonlinear aspect of confidence is really interesting. Really, really interesting. Because leadership, especially for folks who aren't quite there yet, can often appear to be completely dependent on your level of confidence, right? And that highly confident leaders often come across as the experts, as the be all end all of what's happening. And what your research shows really is that sometimes those folks aren't in the best learning zone, as you say. You also talk about in the book, the superhuman stance. And I think this is where this kind of plays in, right? Is this idea that somehow um, we have to take that human superhuman stance to demonstrate our own leadership. It struck me very, very powerfully in the book because it was really, I've, I've experienced that with leaders over my own career, where there's, it's difficult to engage folks like that. It's difficult to converse with them. It's difficult to be heard by folks like leaders like that, right? And it can be very challenging. It also can perpetuate, you know, bad leadership styles in a profession. And I'm curious from your experience that how it's changed in the business world because I get the sense in my own reading of, you know, various books and listening to podcasts and stuff that there has been a shift in the business world towards coachability and towards tempering of that confidence. Have you seen that over your career? I've seen that. And by the way, I teach at the Felt University of Minnesota now. After my corporate career, I teach the executive MBA program. I always get a few Mayo doctors that are now in administrative roles trying to pick up on the leadership piece and delightful, very smart add a lot to the class. But I remember one talking about some of the residents that, you know, and, and she was directing the emergency room that just, you know, came off with the superhuman stance. So like, you know, and sometimes that led to ba bad outcomes that you had to both be confident what you know, but to be open and curious to learn more. So in the corporate world, I think this notion about collaboration, authenticity with, you know, confidence, but knowing that, hey, I'm not all knowing and chances are the higher I'm up in the organization, the further I'm removed from what's really going on. So I need to get back in touch with that. One of the techniques that I, I suggest for people at Chief, I want to get my learning zone more, how do I do it? And so you, you got to have one or two trusted advisors, one, one of those people that will pull you aside, give you a few tips. Hey, you may not notice this, but here's how you're coming across or someone that you can go to 
that uh, say, hey, um, you know, I'm struggling with this or, hey, you know, if you were me, what would you look out for? And again, I, I think that's one way that you avoid both the false finish line and the superhuman stances, you know, find ways to engage with people that will tell you what's really going on about your leadership, but in, in a very supportive way. And I say you need enough confidence, but again, it's the humility that I'm not the smartest person in the world for everything. And I always have little blind spots and every once in a while they matter, but it, it's a delicate balance because again, I think of your profession and, and business leaders, I don't want my CEO running down the hallway every day saying, what should I do? What should I do? Right. You know, come on, have a game plan, you know, yeah, give us a yeah, direction. Yeah, yeah. But you know, if he's running down the hallway every day saying, follow me and like he's going the wrong direction, but he's not listening, that's not good either. So you have to find your own style and balance of doing that. But again, you go back to the, hey, you know, think about your sweet spot. Where, when are you in your learning zone and how do you transfer where you are those practices to your own leadership by those four habits? How do I get more input seeking, whether it's trust advisor or feedback from others? I always find having, well, I'll give you one other little quick technique that if, if people want to start practicing this is with the right people, ask two questions. And the first question is, hey, of what I'm doing, you know, given a project circumstance, et cetera, what am I doing well I should keep doing? And then what's one thing I could do differently that would be even better next time? What am I doing? What could I do differently even better next time? And it gives you, what I like about those two questions is it, it affirms the confidence. Yep. Doing well. Good. Keep that up. Because sometimes we miss that too, where we're having a very positive impact. So that's affirming. But then that humility about, and, and what might be better? And it, it's not a commitment that you've got to do everything people say, but you're curious to know. It's a good after action review technique. And, and I'm sure that, you know, in medicine, there's lots of practices about uh, postmortems and, you know, after action reviews, et cetera. Apply that to your own leadership. Again, it could be a trust advisor. It could be with a small team, but get in the habit of asking those two questions. I, I, by the way, just to let you know, when you and I are done, with recording this podcast, I'm going to ask you to stay on for a minute <laughs> and I'm going to ask you two questions. And it's going to be, hey, I keep doing podcasts. I want to keep getting better. What's one thing I've done well in this podcast I should keep doing from your point of view? And what's one thing that would be even, even better next time? And I have learned so much by just dropping those two questions every once in a while. You've brought the conversation to a really great area because in my own journey to become a coach, I learned not only a lot about myself, but a lot about this aspect of feedback. And where we started was, you know, coachability is a lot about feedback. And I've read a lot on it and I really was struggling with it for many years into what really is the best way to give and receive. Because now, as an academic physician, I have a lot of feedback to give to trainees and students and residents and so on. My colleagues, our private practice colleagues, although not in an academic environment, have staff, have patients, have colleagues. It's Feedback is an inherent constant within medicine. You know, the concepts of feedback, I think a lot of physicians struggled with. Through my coaching journey and becoming a coach, I started reading Marshall Goldsmith, who I'm sure you've heard of. And I came upon this feed forward idea. And the feed forward idea is exactly what you're talking about. And what I've encouraged my trainees to do is ask those questions of themselves first. And I'd like you to tell me one thing that you've did really well in the surgery or did really well in clinic. And then I'd like you to tell me some things you'd like to work on. And in this idea of having the person who is receiving the feedback help define the feedback, because it begins to put their mind in the cognitive state, the learning zone, rather than being somebody who's just getting kind of dumped on with my own biased assessment of their performance, right? And it makes it very hard. It was hard for me when I was a when I was a trainee and I was looking for feedback as to how I was doing as a surgical resident. Sometimes it it was helpful, and other times it just felt more some negative feedback and that wasn't really all that constructive. And it took me out of that growth mindset, right? It took me out of that mindset to say, "What can I really learn?" And so it's a those questions are truly powerful. But the idea of coachability that I think you stress here is. How do, you, how do I get into it? 
how do I get into that to become a better leader in this case, but a better surgeon or a better, you know, communicator with my patients? I love that you're adapting those two questions. And then, you know, the book's got it. You know, what I did is first half of the book, what's the case for coachability? What is this? What does the literature say? And then the second half is, right, here's what we found. You know, here are seven things that highly coachable people do when they're seeking input. I'll give you another one, for example, in addition to those questions, is they, they plan it. You know, I think about all the planning we do. Do you ever plan for how I want to be coached and learning for the next 90 days or six months? And so one thing I do in the, in the workshops and classes, I say, all right, here, let's put a map together. Three columns. Imagine this left column. What are you curious about? What are the things you would like to get better at or learn or how you're doing and how you coming across? Middle column. Who would you ask? And then the final column is it. And what would be the first steps? Where, where would be the circumstances you could be asking the questions or learning a bit and just being a little more proactive on, hey, you know, these are the things I'd like to learn about. And, you know, I'm going to ask more or whatnot, but, uh, you know, you don't need to do everything on your map, but you need to have one or two ideas. In the next couple of days, I'm going to be guest lecturing in one of the university's graduate leadership courses. And these are people younger in their career, usually uh, again, a couple of years out of school, coming back for an MBA graduate degree, but still early. And what I find is they ask the wrong question. And the question they ask is, how am I doing? And of course, most people say, well, you're doing fine. Go back to work. <laughs> like, because they're not like, I don't know if you're serious or not. So what I teach them is like, well, prime the pump, have a couple areas like, hey, I'm trying to get better at listening and not interrupting people. Could you give me any input on how am I doing on that or how to get better and, as well as anything else? And so to have a topic to get started with, by the way, that's one of my real ones is, is learn how not to interrupt people <laughs> when they're talking. And also, how am I doing on that? And I think that both gives you input ideas, but also turns the other person from critic to coach. You know, say, hey, here, here's one area. Now, if there's other areas, I'm open for it, but here's one in particular I'm working on. So I think everyone out there, the question is, what do you want to be in the learning zone for when it comes to your leadership? That's a question to think about. No, it's fantastic. I've done those exercises myself, right? And I don't, and I probably need to do it more. I'll admit I need to get on more of a plan, which is what I learned from your book, from your book. And coaches do help. I mean, I do, I, I think coaches fill a role that are, that physicians really need. Medicine, you know, medicine suffers from an inordinate kind of dumping of tasks on clinicians, right? In a way that that is often, you know, overwhelming when you really hear the 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 work on burnout and you hear how physicians are leaving medicine and and so on. It's it's hard, I think, for a lot of physicians to really step back and have those learning moments and 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 be able to do that planning and be able to do that work towards growing. And so coaches really do help with that, as my clients tell me. But I've experienced as well, even going through the training of saying, okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work on, you know, maybe that aspect of the disc profile that I was, you know, that stood out to me. So it, it's intentional. And I think that's a theme that I'm hearing with in, in, in what you're saying is there's an intentionality to it that brings not only good practice for you as the coachable person, but also in engaging the people around you that you can learn from, which I think is really important. To get the most out of your career as a physician, you need an employment contract that supports you. Unfortunately, most contracts do not initially include everything you need to be successful. Employers draft contracts with their best interests in mind but the terms that benefit your employer are rarely as valuable to you. Before signing an employment contract, you should always make sure your salary, bonuses, paid time off, and other terms are fair. Resolve is the one and only place you can get live salary data, so you know exactly what's happening in your specialty at all times. The best part of the data is that it's verified from real physician contracts. With access to data on what physicians like you are earning, you know when you're being underpaid and can confidently ask for what you deserve. In addition to providing data, they're the number one firm specializing in physician employment contracts. They work with every specialty nationwide. At Resolve, you get connected with an experienced attorney who will work with you one-on-one -on -one to ensure you sign with confidence. Your attorney will take your priorities into account address concerns, make suggestions, and help you strategize for any negotiation. 
They can even negotiate with an employer on your behalf. So whether you're a seasoned attending or just finished training, Resolve is here to support you in every step of the way. Visit resolve.com to learn more and discover how to sign your ideal employment contract. Resolve, your trusted partner for physician contract review, negotiations, and salary data. One of the interesting things that you mentioned, I've got a little assessment tool online people can try. And usually that's the beginning of a you know, learning event or a coaching session, but you, you can take it just to get some self-insight. That comes from a larger study that we had well over 100 items. We we're you know, researching what is coachability, making sure we had something that had the right levels of validity and reliability and all that. And then I said, you know what? That's great, but the world does not need another 150 item questionnaire. Let's regress it down. So what you see online is the 30 some items that were most predictive on whether others see you as being coachable or not. But last summer, I did a revalidation. We had 332 cases where we had leaders. We had, again, 360s on how other people judged are you coachable or not. And then we had their self-assessment from this instrument. And what's fascinating is the uh, psychometrician I worked with came back and said, Kevin, five questions. Five questions alone predicted whether someone was going to be highly coachable. I said, oh, you tell me for five. Well, we needed all 30 some. Two of them made sense. And it were the things we're talking about. One question the highly coachable leaders would say is, feedback is mission critical for me to get my job done. Now, notice it isn't nice to do. It makes other people happy. Like, no, no, I can't get there unless I get that input feedback coaching from others. The second related one was, feedback is mission critical for me to develop and grow. And same thing. It's like, I'm, I'm going to stall out unless I get you know, input from others. That, that made sense. So that, I call that the why of coachability. So back to why do you want to spend the time? You're busy. You got other things you'll be doing. Like, no, why would you want to spend the time reflecting being coachable and then doing the things we've talked about? The second three this group was fascinating because it was items on empathy, gratitude, and diversity. And those three, again, predicted whether someone's going to be highly coached because, you know, I'm empathetic with others. I'm grateful when someone gives me coaching and feedback. And I, I want diversity of thought and, and people that see the world differently than I do. And I think that's while well, we talked about the why of coachability. I think it's the who. So the one thing I've come to appreciate is why would you spend time doing this is, yeah, you can get your stuff done. But I think also if you value relationships this is something that's important for that relationship building and valuing how other people see things differently. And again, having that empathy, gratitude, and search for diversity because people do see the world differently and that can help you out, but again, help the relationships. So I don't want you to make out of that, but that's kind of the second piece of it. It's enormously important and it really resonates because as I'm listening to you, I'm kind of thinking, you know, physicians almost have a, a split world and I'm making this up on the fly. So it's, I don't have it totally well defined yet, but you know, we live in kind of two spaces. We live in the professional space, right? The professional space where we interact with our colleagues, our staff, the communication can sometimes be different and the relationships are different. It's working relationships, right? Like we have tasks to get done. We have to get these studies done. We have to get this surgery done. How do we make, it's much more akin to work that we, that we would think of in maybe other professions. But we also have this enormously big role as caregivers. And as caregivers, those relationships are often different and they're often more emotionally charged. There, there's a, often a hierarchy there, that there is a hierarchy in the professional world, in the interprofessional world. But with patients in particular, it, I think, you know, one of the challenges is that those relationships are the most diverse in a lot of ways, because we're meeting people from all over, right? Every, every aspect of life that you could possibly think of, right? Every person from every culture that you can think of. And one of the challenges is with all the tasks that we have done or have to get done rather as physicians it's often very difficult to get the feedback that you want from those relationships in a way that helps you improve your being a clinician. And so I'm as, as I'm listening to you, you know, we, even in medicine right now, there's a lot of talk about, you know, online reviews and all of these different things as ways to get, you know, 
kind of some superficial feedback. But when I'm with patients, I really do try to listen. And oftentimes I will ask, you know, how did I communicate? Was I, was I clear enough? Did I help you understand what's going on with you? And I think a lot of doctors do that, I think. But it's something that, you know, and I want to just make a plug for the podcast and what Dr. Block has, you know, done here and has a lot of different uh, episodes on becoming a better communicator in medicine. So go and listen to that because they're very good. But <clears throat> seeking feedback in that environment is also very important. So for the physicians out there, that's a distinction. And we're constantly looking for feedback to get better in those two spaces. So it's really relevant. And I really love the aspect of bringing diversity into it because I think that we can, and Dr. Black, who's the, you know, the host of this podcast, when I was on, we talked a lot about how we often kind of come up with a story, a, a narrative or a, a speech that we give every patient or that we give every staff member or all of our colleagues because it, it makes the thinking easier. But as you turn yourself into a coachable person, right, with the work that you've done, I think you're able to get a richer experience and richer feedback and you grow more. Mm -hmm. A good example of the mindset about, you know, you're confident, you're competent, but you're always curious. And, and in valuing the relationships, communication is paramount. So that notion, okay, here, here's a couple of questions I want to ask to keep learning. And I love the ones you, you put out there. By the way, I think that's also, you know, patients probably the most fraught with challenges given the, you know, what's going on. But also, I think with your coll other colleagues you're working with, there's an opportunity to say, hey, trying to get, you know, work on the communication thing. How's it going? What uh, what might I do that'd be more helpful here? But, you know, with humility that, that you know, you're confident, you know, back to that, I want to be in my learning zone on this. And, you know, I, can, I admit I did a, a series of trainings for all of the retail managers for a large organization last year. And the one thing I asked, like, I think about the last 30 days, to what degree in looking at your calendar, were you actually operating in your learning zone? And they came back with an average of about 25%, which I think is, you know, fairly candid and like, yep, you know, oftentimes run automatic. We're giving the speeches. We're busy. We're moving ahead. We're handling things thrown our way. But that notion about being intentional, stepping back, or as one Harvard professor said, every once in a while as a leader, you have to get off the dance floor, get up to the balcony, see what's going on, and get back down on the dance floor. And that notion about how do I, you know, reflect, disengage so that I can get back in the game even better. And one thing that I advocate for, in at least in the business world, is, yeah, put it on your calendar. You know, you can have walk routines, you can have exercise, you could have the coaching, coffee with the coach, and really have those regular conversations that pull you in that learning zone. But I often I'll say, hey, you know, you should have 15 minutes, maybe on a Friday, you know, put it on your calendar. That's your time. Shut everything down. You're there to reflect. What did I hear this week? How am I doing? You know, the thing I'm trying to work on. Did I hear anything that, you know, I'm trying to make sense out of? And at least those 15 minutes get you back into that intentional practice. So one thing I'd put out to, of everything you're hearing in all these great podcasts is, yeah, in addition to consuming it, you should have some reflection time booked, get away from it. It might not be, you know, in the office where everyone can have access to you, but that is so important because I mean, here, here's the bottom line. Have you ever worked for a leader that did not reflect, that had lost perspective? It's not a pretty thing. And you don't want to become that. And the world will push you into that zone unless you find reflection routines. You know, I'm not just, you know, am, am I keep working on the practice, but how am I doing? How am I impacting others? What am I hearing as a message? Where am I trying to get better? Where am I, you know, if you will, using the confidence that I should? And then where could I ask a few more questions? You got to tell me where that would fit into someone's clinical calendar. But that notion about, yeah, you got to get away. You got to get away. It's challenging. Although I will say, you know, in talking to my colleagues that, you know, there's a number of ways that I've really marveled at my colleagues' ability to do this and in, in, you know, journaling and taking a walk and finding that time with their spouse or their child or whomever where it's, and I think it's worth mentioning that it's not a distraction right? That it truly is an intentional reflection, as you say, that, that gives you just that pause to, to really want to grow and learn. And I think that, you know, medicine can be overwhelming as a, as a profession, 
there's no shortage of stress. There's no shortage of managing, you know, perceived threats to your time and to your reputation and to your well-being. And you can, your, your energy and your time can be eaten up, you know, playing defense. And if you don't, you know, get into that learning zone, I would, I would argue that's a big part of the burnout crisis that we're facing. There's a lot that can be done systemically and institutionally to help that, which is a whole nother conversation. But I think recognizing, you know, your, where you are in your career and using this idea of coachability is a great way to do that, I think. Which, you know, given the, the, the kind of the, the labeling and that I think back to the having a coach, having a trusted advisors, having mentors and having regular conversations. One thing I'll do in my class is I'll say, I imagine you've got a new challenge, never faced it before, but I'm going to allow you to take, make two phone calls. Who are you going to call? And I said, no, should I do have a trusted advisor? Who am I going to that could guide me here? And then to say, and who's the next one? You know, how can you have more than two of those? And then when was the last time they talked to you? So one of the ways that I think you can be more intentional is to, you know, have more of those relationship conversations, you know, with peers. One of the things that I would do at uh, my old company, when someone was promoted to divisional president, running a multi-billion dollar operation, I would have a little orientation. I'd say, you know, based on other people that have done this move well, uh, your world's going to change. And one of the ways it's going to change is you can't talk to the people that you used to hang around with the way you used to. You know, the boss, you've got a shadow of leadership. Your voice is louder than you think, yet you can't get lonely because I think isolation is a killer. And if I look at the leaders that I saw derailed, every once in a while you'd scratch your head and say, that was such a smart leader. What were they thinking when they did that? Like, no, they weren't thinking. They were just operating out of that, you know, learning zone. And so that notion about having valued relationships, having trusted advisors, having people that you can compare notes with, is so valuable and avoiding that isolation, which was, you know, back to, we were talking about the false finish line, get in the way of being coachable, uh, the superhuman stance. We, we, we kind of went and went, we're so busy. It's, and I call that, by the way, the, the magical moment mirage, because I'll do a, a workshop on coachability and people say, you know what? I love this. I'm going to get into coachability as soon as things slow down. Oh, it's not going to happen. You got to find, you got to find small ways. You got to small ways, use a little rudder, kind of move things a little bit to build in more time again for, for thinking and reflection and communication and connecting. And then you're going to get back in the game better. And so that, you know, that's just an urge about everything you're hearing in this podcast. Hey, pick one thing, pick one little thing you can start doing that is going to unlock some of that coachability that you, you have in other parts of your profession to your own leadership. It's a, it's such an important point that you bring up because I'll say just my own experience of the first you know, a few years of my practice. I've been in practice now for a little over a decade. And those first years, there's no room. It does, Well, at least there feels like there's no room, right? There's no room because you're trying to perfect your craft. You're trying to make sure all the patients are taken care of. You're trying to manage your reputation. You're trying to build maybe a research career or your private practice. or And it just never feels like you can let go. And that really, I, well, I'm not going to say it for other people, but I'm going to say it for myself. In hindsight, now being a coach and recognizing all of the wonderful things that comes from coaching, and it, boy, I wish somebody had told me that back then, right? So boy, I wish I had met you back then and said, take, put it in your calendar, put it in Saturday morning before the kids are up, before, before you start your day, just take a moment really intentionally. And it, like you said, it doesn't have to be all of it. It has to be one thing or maybe two things. And, and I see it in my colleagues who are pushing as hard as they can to establish their career and establish themselves as a, as an expert, right? I mean, that's, you know, it's interesting. We started this with leadership, but I think one of the ways it really does um, translate into medicine is that we are always trying to achieve this superhuman stance because expertise in medicine is valued and it is expected. And, and so um, we want to be the best. We want to be as rigorous in our diagnostic and treatment thinking as we can be. Nonetheless, we have to recognize the limits of that and the ways in which it can hinder our growth. 
And I think that's where your work is really valuable for our listeners. Yeah. And again, one of the faulty assumptions in the book is that lonely leader lament that, you know, in that search of expertise or, you know, being in charge, that we tend to get more isolated than we should, and then we lose perspective. And so getting that back, interesting, it reminded me that we did a study once of our best R&D leaders, you know, who were really the experts. And as we looked into who they were, what they're good at, and how others see them, and again, we, we used an assessment tool, others saw their relationship building skills to be strong. And you say, wait a minute, what does expertise have to do with relationship building? And we said, well, if you're really good at something, chances are you've got friends you talk to about it. <laughs> and so that notion about you're not just in the lab doing it yourself, you have a robust network. So you not just know what you know, you know what the best are thinking, and then you're building on that. And so I just reminded that, yeah, expertise in your craft is all about relationships as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll give the listeners just a quick story because when I came to my current institution, I didn't have a ton of mentorship, actually. I showed up and was kind of the expert right out of fellowship. And, you know, that was pretty heavy because a lot of my colleagues, you know, have senior mentorship to kind of help them guide them along in those first uh, few years of practice. And it was a poignant time in my life and it really made me understand the value of relationships and how I lead now and what I can do for my colleagues who are years behind me and building that for themselves and giving them the space to ask for, you know, how am I doing? How am I doing with, you know, this surgery? How am I doing with my communication with, you know, you know, uh, the partners, et cetera, and all those little things that define the relationships. It is so important, and, but it does. It's, it is a, it's a strange phenomenon if you think about the fact that the relationships define it, yet we're often a little blind to the relationships in those moments because we're so consumed with ourselves and not in an egotistical way. It's just that the the push to to achieve that expertise can consume us. And it is a lesson for all of us to, again, find that time, find those relationships, find that trusted advisor, get a coach. If that, if you can't find that person, you know, naturally through, through, you know, your relationships, find a coach because it really can give you that opportunity to slow down and explore that and really change your mindset in, in the best possible way. It's a great investment. And I always see it both in terms of you got something you need to work on, but just, hey, I just want to continue at a higher level and having a, you know, a partner with you on that is so important. I used to broker a lot of executive coaches in, 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 in my corporate days. And everyone's why I'd say, you know what, I'm hiring you, but not for somebody else, for me. <laughs> and I would take a, a couple months engagement, just I'm working on this, or what do you think about that? And a couple of places, I would have made some really bad career decisions if I hadn't had that reflective time with a coach. I was being pushed in a direction like that would not have been great for my career, but because I had that supportive relationship that I made time for. And the other thing that I was noticing, I'm reading the work of Dr. Rob Cross, Baps in College. He's really like the world expert on relationship networking. And he just came out with a book, really good book called Micro Stresses. He had interviewed 600 high performers and we found was 90% of them underneath that high performance were really stressed out. And what he found, it wasn't like a big thing. It was just all the little things in life that just kind of keep nipping at you that added up. But then he found the 10% like, no, that they rose above that. And certainly they found ways of dealing with the little micro stressors, but he found that their relationships were much stronger. That both in work as well as hobbies, community, et cetera, that they invested in those things that gave them perspective so that, you know, when you had a flat tire on one part of the car, you know, the rest of the car was doing fine. And that notion about if we get too isolated or, or too single focused, that can throw off our perspective. So I just like that point of view about you could be really, you know, I, I, I completely understand the sort of the demands, the impossible demands that your leaders are, are your, your listeners are facing. But that notion about am I also keeping the relationships going? Because in the, the day, those are the things that are going to matter. Yeah. No, it's great. It, yeah, it's imagining our listeners hearing that word micro stressors and going, 
well, there's, yeah, there's the micro stressors, there's the macro stressors, there's the enormous stressors, right? And it is, it's, you know, I am in my own coaching material, I talk about being a cognitive Sherpa, right? For my clients. And I bring that up just to say that echoing what you're saying about this, finding somebody who can, in, in a sense, help you carry the load, right? In a sense, help you, you know, if you're struggling up that hill with all of these thoughts, with all of these, you know, demands and intentions and decisions to make, and it's all consuming. I mean, it's truly all consuming. And as you said, once you start isolating yourself, it's not like the load gets any smaller. It keeps building, especially as you enter into leadership, right? Suddenly you are faced with, you know, much larger decisions that affect lots and lots of people potentially. And so those those moments are really where it, it pays to assess your coachability, assess your ability to learn and, uh, and move forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Back to the, you know, again, I'm very optimistic that I think we had it naturally early in our careers and we just have to find little ways of getting those habits back. And again, that notion about, you know, I'm not done. I want to keep learning, growing, confident in what I am and who I am, but also, you know, as, as someone once said that anytime I'm getting feedback, it's not about me, it's for me. And that notion about in service of where I'm trying to, where I'm trying to improve. And I think that's a very confident stance. Well, fantastic. Well, I've taken a lot of your time, but it's been so great. I really appreciate it. And uh, to our listeners, I really want to stress again, the coachableleader.com is Kevin Wilde's website where you can find that self-assessment. It's phenomenal. I suggest everybody take it. It, it really provides a great moment to reflect. Yeah, and, and hopefully it's helpful, but also just say the accompanying piece is in the book. You know, coachability, the leadership superpower, it's out there as well. And I think back to the, it really establishes the case, talks about here's kind of what it looks like in practice, but then very specific tips. And I've got worksheets and things, and there might be a few there that would be helpful. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you. Thanks to Dr. Block for the opportunity to be on the podcast. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks again from Heidi. Elevate your practice with a free AI scribe, zero cost, HIPAA compliant, and time saving. Ready to swap? We've got you covered for past AI scribe expenses. Head to HeidiHealth.com, get started, and make your practice the envy of every stethoscope in town. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. 